mode. Hello everyone, welcome to our June JSC webinar. My name is Michelle Everson. I'm the current editor for JSC and I'm from the University of Minnesota. And in a moment I'll introduce our webinar speaker for today. I just want to remind everyone first about how our webinars work. Our speaker will be talking for roughly about 20 minutes or so and then we'll have some time for questions. And if you have any questions, please type them in the questions box at any time during the presentation or after, and then I will ask those questions of our speaker. So I'm very excited today to present Caroline Brophy from the National University of Ireland, Maynooth. And she's going to be talking about a paper that was published in a recent issue of JSE. It's called Engaging Students in a Large Lecture, an Experiment Using Sudoku Puzzles. So go ahead, Caroline. Okay, thank you Michelle for the introduction and thank you also for the invitation to give this webinar. So I'm based in the National University of Ireland in Maynooth for a little bit, a little bit west of Dublin and I'm going to talk today about an experiment that I've done a number of times with my first year group which is, as you can tell from the title is based on a Sudoku puzzle. Uh, so first off I would like to introduce my collaborator on the project. So Lucas Hahn uh, was my collaborator on this project. So Lucas did his undergraduate degree in Ulm University in Germany and during this time he spent a year at NUI Maynooth here in Ireland uh, as, as an Erasmus student and it was during this time that Lucas and I began to work on this project. So Lucas is currently studying for a Master's in Statistics at the University of Waterloo in Canada and I believe Lucas is logged in here today so he'll be able to, to join in to the, the questions and answer session later on. So hi to Lucas. Okay, so I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of background on kind of where the, kind of the motivation for the experiments came from. So for, for those of you that are kind of used to, to teaching large groups, um, you'll be familiar with some of the difficulties that might arise. Um, so just for example, here in Minute, our first science group currently stands at 450 students in around that size. And, you know, obviously within a first year group, you have a huge range of previous statistical experience, uh, depending on maybe when they did uh, their, their equivalent of their end of high school exams here in Ireland. And of course they might have a range of abilities as well because some students are coming in with the intention of doing a degree very much focused on quantitative skills and others are planning to, to avoid that route altogether. So there's a range of ability and previous experience. So it can be difficult first of all to, to gauge you know, what kind of level you should kind of introduce a statistic, like an introductory statistics course at, you know, whether you'll have enough information there to challenge the students who are a little bit ahead in terms of experience and ability, but also enough to cover any of the gaps that the, the students who aren't so advanced that you'll be able to cover the gaps that they've missed um, along their route to, to first year science. So often it's, you know, it's very good to try and engage the students using different sources of data and that can be one way very much that students can get involved and start to get the idea of what statistics is about. So typically what people have done in introductory first year classes will be maybe to use data sets that come from textbooks and there's brilliant resources out there so there's lots of different data sets that you can get and they come with good stories. Um, also what people might do is record personal information on students. So these days you might record things like you know, their Facebook usage and of course they're going to be interested in, in that sort of thing. Um, when it comes to collecting personal information on students though, the downside of that is that you know, well, when, it comes to, when it comes to introducing people to statistics, often people kind of have this idea that it's all about just collecting numbers and you know, they might ask you for example, oh you're a statistician and once they've got over you know, the look of, uh, look of horror on their faces and they feel a little bit sorry for you, they start to ask you questions like, oh well, you know, what percentage of people in Ireland now are going to be watching all the matches in the World Cup or just for example, or they think it's all about collating percentages and of course that is a part of statistics but it is great to be able to introduce even at an introductory level the idea and the concepts around hypothesis hypothesis testing and you know why you would want to come up with questions and how you could go about answering them using statistical information. So when you check personal information on students it's, it's not so easy to test hypotheses on that kind of data. So to be able to do an experiment where you can really start to show people how to test hypotheses even if you're not going to do the detail of hypothesis testing in the class it can be great just to introduce them to the ideas of it. So this is kind of the background with which kind of made me decide that I wanted to try and do an experiment in class. Um, but obviously when you're dealing with classes of the size in the hundreds, it's, uh, it's difficult enough to come up with an experiment that, that will work well in class. So the experiment that I designed was based on a Sudoku, like a Sudoku puzzle. 
So for anyone that's not familiar with Sudoku, it's a logic puzzle, uh, not a mathematical one, it's purely logic, um, but the numbers in this grid here, the numbers 1 to 9 appear, what you want to do is you want to have the numbers 1 to 9 in every box, you also want to have the numbers 1 to 9 in every row, and also in every column. And so, for example, if you take the box on the left-hand side there in the middle, what you can see is there's the numbers 5, 9, 4, and 8. And if you think about where the number 1 might fit into this, well, there's a few, there's a few places where automatically you can't fit the number 1 in because it's either in that row or it's in that column. So if you have a look, you can see that the only place that the number 1 can actually appear in that box is in the cell that I've just highlighted there. And so that's, it's that kind of logic that you use to determine what should go into to every cell. And so you continue on, you have to fill out all of the, all the empty cells in the grid. So Stoku puzzles will have varying levels of difficulty. So this one will be difficult enough, but it might take a few minutes or more even to do, depending on you know, whether you're used to playing these kinds of puzzles or not. So I wanted a puzzle that would be pretty quick to do in class. So instead of using a 9 by 9 grid, I used um, a 6 by 6 grid. And you can see the box in the middle there on the left-hand side, there's only one cell missing. The same with the box in the middle on the right-hand side, there's only one cell missing. And so this puzzle would be pretty easy to fill out, for, especially for anyone that had ever played Sudoku before. And the idea was I wanted a puzzle that could be completed within just a couple of minutes. So the factor that was manipulated in the experiment was the type of Sudoku puzzle. So these are the four different types of puzzles. So we've got the numbers that you've just seen there a moment ago. And we've also got the letters. And there's also, in this case, we've got the Greek letters. And we've also got the, the random symbols down in the bottom right. So these are, in fact, the exact same puzzle. They're just different characteristics, depending on which of the types you're, you're dealing with. But so, for example, the number 1 in the numbers is equivalent to the letter A in the letters. It's equivalent to alpha in the Greek letters. And it's equiv equivalent to the, the square, the black the built-in square in the random symbols. So the idea was that everybody would complete one of these four types of Sudoku. And what I, the way that I did that was I would have prepared a handout before the class that would allow the students, that the students would fill out during the class. So the handout contained, first of all, the instructions on how to complete the Sudoku puzzle. I didn't go through in a lot of detail before giving out the handouts how to do a Sudoku puzzle, but I did tell the students they needed to read the instructions. So the instructions about you know, being a logic puzzle and how to fill it out are there. Also, one of the four types of Sudoku puzzles is on the handout. Each student just got one Sudoku puzzle to complete. There was a space then for recording the completion time. And there was also an additional question down the end that was, have you ever played a Sudoku puzzle before or not? This is just to gauge previous experience. So the handout, this is the handout here. And the logistics then in terms of the class, what I usually did was I did the experiment on the first day of class. And typically, I would have waited until about the last 20 minutes of class. And the handouts, I would have had them printed and ready to go and interleaved so that this would help with the randomization process in class. And also, you wouldn't want two students sitting beside each other to do the same, the same puzzle. And in fact, those handouts are available at the end of the paper, uh, the online version of the paper there. You can have a look at that yourselves. So, there's the printed handout that's ready to go. I would also place a stopwatch up on the screen where everybody could see. And then before I could do anything, and before I hand out the handouts or anything, I would explain to the students that what they'll need to do is read the instructions. They'll need to complete the puzzle. They'll need to also record the length of time it took to complete their puzzle and answer the question at the end. And then also they'll need to maintain exam-like conditions throughout the whole of the experiment. So I think one of the first couple of years I did the experiment when I was explaining about the exam-like conditions, um, I said to the class, you know, 20 minutes to go, first day of term, and there was, so for most students, it was probably their first or second day in university altogether. And I said to them, right, now we're going to do an exam with a very serious face on me. And anyway, there was a few white faces that looked back on me, but I said to them, no, no, it's going to be a very easy exam. It'll be anonymous, and actually, it'll be fun. But anyway, I think a few people didn't get over the shock of it. So I decided that wasn't a strategy to go. But generally, I find that the students are keen to partake, and it's not an issue getting them to, to maintain kind of silence throughout the, the whole of the process. So we would give out all of the handouts then, but I would ask all of the students to keep them face down so until, until the process starts. And as soon as everybody has a handout, I'll start the stopwatch on the screen, and I'll also instruct the students to start straight away. And then, obviously, you want them to be quiet throughout the whole thing, so they usually are. And then as people start to finish, I'll just collect up the handouts and 
and it's usually then by the end of the class um, I have all of the, the handouts and after the class then I need to manually record the data. So that part is a little bit tedious but to be honest it's not too big of a deal because really each sheet only just takes a matter of seconds and so you know within a couple of hours, I mean obviously it depends on the size of the, the class but usually within a couple of hours it's manageable to have all of the data recorded. So it's not too, it's not too onerous. So the data, the variables that you need to record from the experiment are first of all the Sudoku type. So what type of puzzle did the student complete? Did they do the letters, the Greeks, the numbers or the symbols? We want to record whether or not the Sudoku was correct because obviously not everybody is going to get their puzzle correct. Even though it's an easy enough puzzle and a lot of people will get it incorrect. Um, so we want to record yes or no whether or not the puzzle was correct. Um, we want to record the time. So the time there is recorded in seconds. This was their completion time. And also then the Sudoku experience, that was the question at the end, whether or not they'd ever played before. So that's just a yes or a no. So the types of variables that we've got, so there's three categorical data variables. We've got Sudoku type, then correct, and also Sudoku experience. And we've got the quantitative data variable time. But it's not just a regular quantitative data variable. So for just obviously the, the first value there is 170 seconds and that's associated with a correct Sudoku. But the first no value there is 255. So obviously that person got their Sudoku incorrect. So uh, we've got what we call a right sensor data variable here. So the 255 seconds is just a lower bound for the length of time it would have taken that person to complete the, the Sudoku correctly. So we've got two different response variables essentially here. We've got correct, yes or no, and we've got time, and the explanatory variables that we've got are Sudoku type and Sudoku experience. Okay, so once you've got the data set recorded, um, it's really it's quite a valuable teaching tool. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit about the, the teaching opportunities that the data set presents. So the first thing is there are, that's, that's, there's a lot of opportunities for discussions on just, for example, the types of data that are in the data set, uh, the hypotheses that you might address, and also just ideas on how to analyze the data. And I find that the students really engage with these discussions, and I always quite enjoy doing these, these discussions with the students. Um, they can really come up with kinds of hypotheses you might want to, the questions you might want to ask of the data. And even though they've got very, very little statistical experience, they can come up with ideas on how to analyze the data. You know, they might even just talk about computing means for the different groups, and this will also automatically lead on to them noticing that you've got a sensor data variable. They won't know the word for it, but they can identify that there's something a bit funny going on there that you can't just maybe compute a straightforward mean of the whole of the group if you've got ones that were correct and ones that were incorrect in there. So it can, you can really have quite interesting discussions with the students on the data set and the experiment. And then, of course, there's lots of other, uh, lots of other techniques that you can illustrate, just lots of different uh, descriptive statistic methodologies, just graphs and tabular form. Uh, you might do a chi-squared test for independence, um, analysis of variance, logistic regression, um, or survival analysis. So I'm not going to go through each of these methods in detail on their own, but what I am going to do is just talk a little bit about the hypotheses that we might ask of the data. So when I set up the experiment, these would have been the hypotheses that I had envisaged um, addressing with the data. So first of all, do Sudoku type and experience affect ability to get Sudoku correct? So that was the first response variable. And then the second response was the length of time. So the second question would be, do, the, do Sudoku type and experience, do they affect the length of time it takes to complete the Sudoku? So what I'm going to do is just focus in on this first hypothesis and go through kind of the teaching methods you might use to, to address this first hypothesis. And so the response here is Sudoku correct. So starting off with Sudoku type, what I've got here is a segmented bar chart of the percentage that got the Sudoku correct, yes or no, uh, for each Greek or for each of the Sudoku types. So we've got the Greeks, the letters, the numbers, and the symbols. So for the Greek type, you can see that the percentage that got the Sudoku incorrect was just a little over 20%. For the letters, a little under 20%, and also for the numbers, a little under 20%. And for the symbols, it was in around 20%. So it looks like the Greek group are a little bit higher in terms of the percentage that got it incorrect, but this could just be random variation across the groups. So to test for a dependence between the two categorical data variables, you can use a chi-square test for independence. So I did that, and you've got a chi-square test statistic value there of 4.62 and that turned out to be non-significant. So there was no evidence of an effect of Sudoku type on the response correct. And it's interesting then to kind of, you know, to question the students as to why they might think this is, and they can usually kind of come up with ideas like, well, you know, there was no limit to the length of time that people had to do it, so therefore, you know, if you found it difficult, you could just spend more time doing it. So that would be a reason maybe why there will be no effect of Sudoku type on the, the response correct. 
So the second thing that I looked at here then is Sudoku experience. So is there an effect of Sudoku experience on correct? And you can see here that there's quite a, it looks like quite a big effect. So for the no group, it was around 50% that got it incorrect. And for the yes group, so they have previous experience of, of playing Sudoku, the, the incorrect percentage was in around 11%. So quite a big difference there between those two groups. And again, that's, you know, you maybe would expect this in terms of previous experience, yes or no. So again, is it a chi-square test for independence to test for a difference between those two groups? And it was highly significant this time, so P less than 0 0.001. So there is strong evidence of a dependence between Sudoku experience and, and correct. Okay, so both of those analyses, you know, the, the segmented bar chart, this is kind of a typical analysis, like a typical graph that you might want to illustrate with a first-year um, introductory group. And also a chi-square test for independence, you might want to go through all of the details of how to do a chi-square test with an introductory group. Um, if you're, if you're dealing with a more advanced group, what you might do is you might use a logistic regression model to address this hypothesis. So obviously I haven't done the logistic regression part now with my first year group, but um, it, is, it is possible if you've got a group that are just a little bit more advanced. So in this case, what you want to do is model the probability of Sudoku being correct. And we can look again at the explanatory variable Sudoku type and Sudoku experience. And this time, though, what we can also do is look at the interaction between Sudoku type and Sudoku experience. So I fitted the several logistic regression models to, to look at these different variables and did likelihood ratio tests to test for differences between them. So first of all, the test for the interaction was non-significant. So this is done using a likelihood ratio test. So the test statistic there was 4 and so the p-value 0.262. So there's no evidence of an interaction between the two variables. We then look at Sudoku experience and found that there was a strong effect of Sudoku experience, so it was highly significant, P less than 0 0.001. And for type then, there was no evidence of a difference between the types in terms of the probability of getting Sudoku correct. Okay, so this method obviously is a little bit more advanced, but it's, um, it's a very useful method because in this case you can test for the interaction between the two variables as well as just look at the, the factors type and experience by themselves. So just to summarize the, what we found then for the first hypothesis, so we found no evidence of an interaction between Sudoku type and experience. Um, we found no evidence of an effect of Sudoku type, so it's saying that you know, whether you've got Greek letters, numbers, or symbols, that doesn't have an impact on whether or not you're going to get the Sudoku correct. But previous experience, the previous Sudoku experience does have a strong effect on the ability to get the Sudoku correct. So those that had no previous experience, they had a probability, an estimated probability of getting Sudoku correct of 0.5, while the groups that did have previous experience, they had an estimated probability of successfully completing Sudoku of 0.89. So quite a difference there between, between the two groups. So the second hypothesis, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, um, but the second hypothesis was, do Sudoku type and experience affect the length of time it takes to complete the Sudoku? So there's a few ways that you might address this hypothesis, and the details of those methods are, are in the paper. So the first thing you might do is to do an analysis of variance on the correct Sudoku only times. Now this does have kind of limited inference because you're restricting the data set to only be the people that got the Sudoku correct. So you would want to kind of point out that there's limited inference with such an analysis, but it is useful to if you want to use, if you want to teach the ANOVA method, it is um, it is a useful useful tool. And the the second thing you might do is use survival analysis on all completion times. So like I say, I'm not going to get into the details here, but we did find, the, in the, paper, the details are in the paper, but we did find a strong effect of Sudoku type on the length of time to completion. And also doing the survival analysis methodology, we also found a strong effect of Sudoku type on the length of time to completion. Um, so just some concluding remarks then. The experiment has proven to be easy to implement with large groups. I've, um, I've never had any difficulties with it, and um, in fact, it can be quite enjoyable to do. It can illustrate the testing of real hypotheses, which I think is a big advantage, even with an introductory group, to be able to say to them, look, you know, as well as collating information, we can also ask real questions and address real questions, and I think that's, that's definitely good. There are, of course, downsides to the experiment. First of all, the manual recording, a little bit tedious, but I've never found it to be too, too difficult. And also, if you are doing any analysis on the subset of correct Sudoku's only, you would just want to watch out that, you, that the, the inferential limitations aren't misunderstood. Uh, but that can be, be emphasised um, in class. So generally, it is a fun in-class activity. 
and it also it really does seem to appear to help the students to engage with with statistics. Um, I've never formally tested whether or not it has an impact on understanding or on grades indeed, but I've always got comments back at the end of the class just to say, oh, we really enjoyed the I really enjoyed the fact that there was data on us used in the class. So I've certainly got good feedback that the students have, have enjoyed it and um, appreciated it. Okay, so thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. This was really interesting. And again, everyone, um, please go ahead and type in questions if you have them, and I can ask them of Caroline. <clears throat> I actually had a couple questions to get us started. Um, you had mentioned earlier that you you wanted a puzzle that students could complete fairly quickly in class. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm curious about how you came up with this idea of having these four different types of Sudoku puzzles. Was, was there something that led you to decide you wanted to use Greek symbols and these other kinds of symbols for the puzzles? Mm -hmm. Um, not really. I mean, to be honest, I think I was going through a little bit of a phase of doing Sudoku puzzles myself at the time, and I devised it, and there's also, I showed the 9 by 9 Sudoku puzzle at the beginning, but also you can actually get larger ones, um, they're 18 by 18, so mm -hmm. they have the numbers 1 to 9, and they also have the letters, um, whatever the first nine letters are, so it's a mm -hmm. mixture of the both, and I had done a few of those puzzles, I think, prior to the kind of this experiment being devised and I think it was from that that I just kind of thought oh well hang on a minute you know maybe there'd be I wonder does it make any difference you know so it was just um, yeah there was no nothing specific really it was just uh, I was thinking about a puzzle because a puzzle is something that you can do in a short length of time and then it was like right well what could we manipulate so yeah okay. I don't know there was no divine inspiration I think it just was a, a process over a bit of time of trying to think what could be manipulated and of course then you know, they're, the first year students, they're taking some math courses as well as stats courses, so the Greek letters are often used in different notations, so I just thought that would be something some of them might be familiar with, mm -hmm. and the random symbols, no, I mean, I don't know where they came from, they were completely <laughs> random. Another question I had is, you presented all these hypotheses, and you talked about these today, are these hypotheses that you share with your students, or do you have them try to generate interesting questions that they might be able to answer based on the data? It's a combination of both. I would first of all ask them and they will usually come up with those questions and sometimes some additional ones as well. But it's, yeah, I mean, I find, I think I mentioned that during the talk that the discussions around the experiment and the data I found to be really beneficial and the students have loved that. They're really engaged with it, even with a big class. And I like them, seeing them to come up with the kinds of questions that you might want to, you might want to ask of the data. And they mm -hmm. definitely, I think every time, I think I will put them up formally at the end, but they will always, they will always come up with questions very similar to it, which is great. Oh, good. So there, there is a question about one of your slides. It's about mm -hmm. slide number 10, it looks like. Um, the question is, I might have thought that incomplete 255 could be considered censored because the student might have completed it given more time, but why is incorrect 255 considered censored? I don't okay, think. so the students weren't actually limited in their time. Okay. So if they made a mistake, though, or maybe they didn't get the concept of how to do the puzzle, I mean, it was, it was basically whatever they handed up, but I didn't, I didn't go to people and say, oh, you're not finished, it's too late, you know, you have to hand it back up. So the 15 to 20 minutes, I mean, most people will have finished it, you know, within a very short space of time, within a few minutes. And so it's kind of, you know, I mean, that student there had gone on for, for a little bit more time, and they had obviously, though they had stopped themselves, they would have decided mm -hmm. to stop themselves. Um, I mean, it's usually, the, the experiment usually comes up to the end of the lecture time, so mm -hmm. even if there are a few students that are still finishing it, I don't actually force them to, to hand it up, like they, um, they, some students will sit and they'll spend yeah. another few minutes while everybody is leaving the lecture, and that's absolutely fine, like I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't stop anybody doing that. So, mm -hmm. so it really, it's a censored in the fact that they have given up, they have stopped themselves. And maybe if they've made, they've either spotted they've made a mistake or they've just filled out all the cells and they're not aware of whether or not they've made a mistake. So, so it's in that regard that it's censored. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Um, the question is, the activity is done on the first day in the course, but when do you do the analyses? Do you do chi-square the first day? No, okay, so yeah, the very first lecture is when I do the experiment, but it's at the end of the very first lecture. So it'll be from lecture two on that I will use the data. 
Um, so the second lecture will typically be where we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about the data and the types of data and I'll ask them about the hypotheses and then it will be further on in the course just depending on you know, the structure of what way I want to do the teaching within the course. So the experiment will kind of appear you know, as we do different topics throughout the course then. But the, the, the initial discussions, like I will always bring up the experiment on the second course of the second mm -hmm. lecture, will be quite dominated on types of data and the experiment is very useful then because that's what they've participated in. And, and have you used this experiment in multiple courses? In not multiple courses, but multiple classes of the same course. So I've run it over a number of years, yeah, but it's always at the same level of class. Do you, have you ever combined all the data together to do anything with that and compare different sections of the class? Or no, you I have use, not okay. done that yet, but that okay. would be a very interesting thing to do. So, yeah. Lucas, are you listening? <laughs> That sounds like a really rich data set. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, because um, actually I used to, I've taught this course a number of times now. I used to teach it to two different groups for a few years in a row, and so mm -hmm. I possibly have seven to eight data sets collected. So oh, yeah, wow. that, would be, that would be great to combine them. I must, um, I must get on that. <laughs> That'll be your next webinar. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, are there any last questions for Caroline before we end our webinar for today? Okay, well, it looks like we're all done with questions. I really thank you again, Caroline, for joining us all the way from Ireland. It was great to have you here. Okay, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you again for the invitation. And I just wanted to um, thank everyone for coming today. Um, we're not really sure when our next JSC webinar will be, but we'll definitely announce that on the CAUSE website when that's coming up. And we hope everyone has a really great summer. So thanks so much for being with us today. And thank you again, Caroline. You're welcome. Thank you.